So I'll, I'll start here, Bob. Uh, hello, welcome to Podiatry Practice Mastery. My name is Don Pelto, and I have uh, Dr. Spalding uh, here with me today. Welcome, Bob. Thank you very much. I appreciate being on your show. Yeah. So we, we I interviewed you a couple years ago. We were talking about you're kind of an entrepreneur and uh, you have your hands in a lot of different things. Tell me kind of what you're what you're up to these days. Well, back in uh, 2006, I wrote a book called Death by Pedicure. And since then, we've been doing online training with nail techs and um, CCPMAs or podiatric medical assistants. And now we just introduced a few months ago a foot care nurse course. Um, the Again, we're very active in online training. I'm also very active in consulting in nail salon lawsuits. I've, we're working probably three of them here in the last six or seven weeks. Um, those oh. are, they, they go on all the time and we have to uh, add whatever we can to that level of information that the attorneys are seeking. But that's something that I've been doing. I, I sort of noticed some parallels to infections associated with nail salons, as you also notice those, I'm sure, through your practices. And there is a there's an association that we kind of latched on to early on in my career. And that's sort of been one of my big advocates as far as uh, nail salon safety. Yeah, Bob, you know, um, so uh, I just want to tell everyone, so I currently have two nail they're going to be pedicure and they're rotating through my office. And I think it's great teaching someone else. I know they're not going to do the, the I'm teaching them to debride with a razor blade and they're not going to do that in the future, but it's good for them to learn those skills. And they're debriding the nails on these difficult diabetics and kind of, you know, people that have amputations and, and the ones that rotating, they're saying they're going to want to do, you know, difficult patients. And so it, it's, it's neat. So they can get that training. How many people do your online training for, for medical, podiatry, medical assistants, and then the nail training and, and things like that, how many per year or, or uh, something like that? Several hundred per year. Okay. Um, we've, we've over since 2006, probably over 2000. Wow. Um, and again, it's broken down into people who don't necessarily want to work in a podiatry office, but just want to work safer in their salons. So we have the Medi-Nail Advanced Nail Technologist training just for those. And, and, and that breaks down into, um, again, COVID has sort of changed this, but prior to this, you couldn't get them to wear gloves. They certainly wouldn't entertain autoclavings or instruments. And they certainly didn't really know how to refer to physicians and not accept those kind of problems associated in a salon and, and when to refer and when to um, accept them. And those are things that we teach in the basic course. And then if they wanna work for or work with a physician podiatrist, then we have the medical nail technicians course, which both of these courses are things that I came up with. And then I wrote the book, Death by Pedicure, which then got um, politically correct toward the science of pedicures on the second edition. We're going to go back to the other title on a third edition that I'm working on. But again, those are the basic courses for nail techs. We also train, um, you know, podiatric medical assistants because 50% of the podiatrists in the U.S. utilize an assistant to help them with routine foot care. The other 50% of the podiatrists wouldn't enter even entertain someone else helping them with their routine foot care. So there's a big split between podiatrists who do recognize the value and those that prefer not to. And um, so we train those people, bring them up to speed. Um, our online training is the first, the original. We have the only physician directed online training. And um, that's based on experience of podiatry as it pertains to safe routine foot care. Um, that's basically what we've been doing now in Canada, foot care nurses. Um, there are about 14,000 foot care nurses in Canada in a population throughout Canada of about 36 million. There's about 1,400 podiatrists. In the US, it's just the opposite. There's about 14,000 podiatrists and about 1,400 foot care nurses. But as podiatrists, 
sometimes as they go into practice, they'll do some nursing homes or they'll still do nursing homes in their practice, but sometimes that relates to the, the, the new partners or, or people who uh, do want to go into the community and provide foot care. Foot care nursing and or medical nail techs uh, under the direction of the podiatrist are also good ancillary, auxiliary, and uh, force multipliers for your practice. So um, some of the foot care nurses practice autonomously. We teach that they need to work with a podiatrist as opposed to there's other courses out there that teach them to go into practice by themselves. Of course, they're limited by their scope of practice as an RN um, as opposed to yeah. obviously the the scope of practice that we have as DPMs. So, so, so Bob, when we, when, when, so the whole focus here is practice management and, and, and things. So I just want to pull, you, you said, so how do you say it professionally, but basically, so if you guys want to, those that are listening, if you want to expand your practice, let's say you don't want to do nursing homes, but you want nursing homes to be done. A possibility is to get a, a nurse to go there, get the training and do that. You get the revenue from it. And they can do something that they'll enjoy. Or if you're in your office and you, like for a lot of us, we limit the amount we do because we're doing it. But you could expand that amount having a, a, a nurse or a, a, a MA do it for you if you train them appropriately. So that's kind of what you're saying, right? So you can make money on the back end of it. That, that's, that's true. Um, of course, there's no real standardization from office to office, from podiatry to podiatrist in how you perform routine foot care. Um, there's still arguments of whether you should autoclave your instruments or not, which we advocate, uh, or using disposable. New, these new neon lippers are actually disposable um, and sometimes much sharper than, say, one that you've been using for three to six months that you haven't sharpened. So there are alternatives to the autoclave. There seems to be some resistance to that. But the reality is, is that almost every single liquid disinfection agent out there, even including glutaraldehyde, um, depending on the time that they're immersed and all the issues associated with using a carcinogenic product like that, autoclaving is simpler. It's yeah. it's a hundred percent guaranteed uh, for the organisms that we have to worry about. We're not talking about thermophiles that live in in underground craters at four or five hundred degrees, but they're not pathogens. So those are the those are the, the, the stats on that. Most people are now gravitating to that, but about half the podiatrists are still using liquid disinfection. Really? Agents. Also, COVID is another big issue um, with nail salons. Most of them were closed for the first half or even a full year before they got those protocols in place for them. And as you know, one of our uh, best trained medical nail techs, Lori Ducharme, who you've worked with and and she's actually gotten the entire uh, community of where she lives for the public health department to mandate it as well as the city of boston now mandates autoclave so they've taken a new role instead of relying yeah. on the cosmetology boards and say massachusetts to uh, administer disinfection standards the public health department has now taken a new role and we hope that that's duplicated throughout the country where the public health department mandates these autoclaves as opposed to just leaving it up to the cosmetology boards. Regrettably, some of them have not seen the inside of a classroom in 30 years. And some of the states that don't require CEUs for cosmetologists really never get introduced to this concept. Yeah, so what do you see for the, for, for the, for the future? You said you're working on some new things. What are you excited about right now? What, what's, what's good for the profession or things like that? Well. Again, one of the big things that COVID brought up is ventilation. And um, ventilation, whether you're talking about protecting yourself with a mask or having high airflow in your rooms, or we deal in a very um, rich environment of pathogens when we are aerosoling all this nail dust, when we're properly uh, using electric files, if they're not equipped with ventilation devices to extract that dust, or if you don't have some ambient to take care of the room, um, then the ventilation becomes a big, potentially long-term hazard for podiatrists and anyone else working in, say, fungal nail debris. 
Um, even in the salon, the same issues are at hand because they're working with acrylics and gels and they're filing those with high speed electric files and that aerosols that. And very few salons have actually gone in and put ventilation in. And many podiatrists don't even use electric files because they feel like it's going to generate too much dust as opposed to uh, devices that can actually make electric files safer. And to properly do the job right, you need electric files to, to do debridement of nails. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and so for those that are listening, if they've made it this far into the interview, they're probably interested in this topic. So uh, uh, in, all, in all honesty, we, we, we've considered using, um, and I'm going to talk about some of the reasons we don't use a, someone to do nail care. So we do a couple of things. We do our own nail care in Massachusetts. And the thought is, what about all this other pathology they may miss that we're getting x-rays, we're doing comprehensive foot exams, we're doing all these other things, and it only takes two minutes to do the nails. So that's the way we think about it. And the other thing that we do to limit the amount we do is we, we have days. So my day is today's Friday. We do, I do nail care on Fridays and that's the only day. So we all limit the amount we do. I do one day, the two other docs do half days. And so we're limiting availability. And if they want their nails grinded or electronic file, we send them somewhere else because we don't have it basically because we don't want to be exposed to all those things. And, and we're, we don't want to, we don't want to tailor ourselves to that public. We do more sports med stuff. So that's just me personally, but I could see a lot of doctors, you know, they, they might do it differently. How do you do it? Do you still practice? Absolutely. Um, you know, um, I, I was also on the local council uh, as a councilman for two terms. And so Fridays, I usually took off just to do council work. Uh, when COVID hit, we had a little bit of a slowdown. So we took Wednesdays off. So I still work three days a week, um, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And the rest of the time, we're doing online care, uh, the online training, and we're doing um, legal consulting for nail salon lawsuits. So that's a typical week. Now, back early on in my career, I gravitated more to routine foot care and broke that down into a science, which is one reason why we have the standards that we're trying to do through, we're trying to promote it throughout the profession that if you're going to do this, you need to do this, this, and this, if you're going to perform routine foot care. And again, that's going to, you know, that's going to depend on physician to physician on, on what their interpretation is. But that's another reason why we need some standards in providing routine foot care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, you know, we autoclave and I didn't know, I didn't know people didn't autoclave. It just makes total sense to autoclave. But uh, yeah, interesting, interesting. And so what are some tips, let's say, because this is mostly podiatrists listening to it. Do you have any good tips in terms of uh, for reimbursement for nail care, for adding other types of add-ons of how to use staff? Do you do your own or does your staff do it for you? Give different tips that are actually working in the trenches. Well, um, when I first started, you know, my, my background before I got into podiatry was law enforcement. And um, so, and I've still for the last, since 1998, I'm, I was in, in law enforcement from 79 to 82 full time. And when I got back to start my practice in 98, my old buddies talked me into coming back as a reserve deputy. So sometimes I approach this from the, the legal component of this, meaning that documentation is key when providing routine foot care that you're billing to, to the, the insurance, especially Medicare. And so documentation comes with pictures. I remember having a conversation with the Medicare director for three states, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia, back when I opened my practice in 98. And I said, you know, really and truly, Medicare doesn't actually trust the doctors anymore. They, they, they uh, uh, unless you're providing extreme documentation, you're not going to be able to build this um, unless you provide in my opinion, pictures to, to document the thickness of the nails. Hmm. And as you know, there is no Medicare edits for what is determined as thickness. There's no, there's no marker. It doesn't have to be two millimeters thick or 10 millimeters thick. It's all interpretation. And when, when a lot of these auditing companies come in um, and look at this, they, they sometimes only get paid if they find something wrong in your documentation. So 
documentation is key and one of those is pain and so since they don't really believe when the doctor says there's pain we have an affidavit filled out by the patient that they have pain they circle the nail it's uncomfortable and if they meet the criteria for nail care usually it's diabetic with neuropathy but if they have thickness and pain that technically meets the criteria it just has to be documented so when i had this discussion with uh uh, Eugene Winters, who was the MD in charge of those three states, he says, you don't really have to approach this um, as a police officer. And of course, you know, he didn't realize I used to work as in law enforcement. I said, actually, you do, because they don't take your word for it that they're having pain. You need to prove that. So pain is a critical component. And so we have them sign an affidavit of pain, and then we document the thickness with pictures and anything else that needs to document. So that's that's the level of detail I take on that. Of course, then you have to keep up with their uh, appointments with their PCPs, and that's got to be every six months documented. Yeah. And then the PCPs got to refer them back technically in their in their own documentation that they referred to the podiatrist for nail care because they are under my care for diabetes. So there's a lot of back and forth paperwork that's got to be there, and obviously it's probably easier to get paid on a bunion sometimes than it is to, to document for routine foot care. But at the same time, that's the level of detail that we go through to make sure our charts and we've never had a problem. In fact, they've asked us not to send our affidavits, affidavits but we send them anyway because then it's between the patient and Medicare, not me and Medicare. That's good, that's good. Wow. Well, I think we 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 covered a, a lot of a lot of ground here. Um, yeah, ex exciting times. Exciting times. Anything else that you're really kind of excited about or interested about? Or anything? yes, uh, Dr. Markinson, who you may be familiar with, uh, yep. does a lot of melanoma. He is going to be um, launching his new training for nail techs on melanomas. He's got a series coming out, um, and so he'll be launching that through the Medi Nail platform. Uh, like I said, we are now. Um, one of the big news things is, is we're the only online training company in the U.S. for foot care nurses with a uh, approval by the state of California. So not only do nurses have to get their CEUs like we do every year, they now can get credit for taking the course and getting CEUs to meet their licensing, annual licensing requirements. And we're the only ones out there that, that can make that statement as an online training company. Um, so again, with we've got a brand new launch to our training platform. We'll be doing beta testing on that next week. We've been working on that for a long time. And so it'll be easier to navigate all the training that we have. So those are some of the big things that we're excited yeah. about um, bringing a higher level of a platform for the people to utilize. Now, for a lot of people that listen to this podcast are entrepreneurs. So let's say... Um, let's just talk, let's talk like making an online course. Do you, do you make it in Joomla? Do you make it in Kajabi? What's the, wh where do you put it up there? The content, you film videos and put them up there with, with tests. How does that work? The, the back end of it? Well, of course, uh, for example, like our medical nail tech, um, medical nail technicians course is 10 modules. There are typically PowerPoints that are, com that are converted to mp4s okay videos and within yep. those and within those there'll be certain links to watch additional videos okay. mm -hmm. uh, like how to use the various equipment um and then we have what's called we just introduced a chemotherapy um course for people handling uh individuals that present and they've got chemotherapy and their nails are detached and or becoming detached Hmm. Their skin has changed due to the chemotherapy treatments for low extremity. So we now have a course that's certified for people who are going to be in, in dealing with chemotherapy, whether it's in a salon and they need to be referred back. We, we talk about their absolute neutrophil count so that they know when to accept those people um, and when not to or when to get a uh, referral from the oncologist. So all of that's in our MediNail master's course. Cool. So again, that's another 12 modules of different information. Also included in that is the COVID information. You know, I mean, um, you know, there's so much, 
political information that seems to get uh, entangled in the COVID um, that we all have to sort of sit back and digest the information and make sometimes our own decisions on that. And um, so we go through a, a, a module in there about how to deal with the ventilation hazards and the COVID yeah. hazards cool. and what's real information, what's not real information on that. So that's part of the MediNail Master Series. And then, and I, I see, I'm looking on the website, it's uh, medinail.com for those that are listening. And then how do you go about getting, I'm just curious, because I'm curious because of the marketing, I just like this. How is it that you push because these these students not push, but you how do you market it within the, the schools? Do the schools market it? Do you do Google AdWords? What's working for you right now? Because you could apply that to your own practice, right? To a podiatry practice. Yes, um, that's a, a big component. Is that uh, for podiatrists who do want to be a little bit more entrepreneurial um, and incorporate a nail salon within their practice? Uh, that is a, uh, you've got to have good trained personnel um, that are working at a higher, more advanced level yeah. because all of our training is not about meeting state standards. It's about exceeding state standards. And that's what MediNail aspires to. Okay. So when you're considering putting one of these as part of your practice, the reason they're going to come to you as opposed to someone down the, the, the road as far as competition is that you're providing a medical expertise as well as a much more uh, hygienic yeah. environment for them. And you're not doing aggressive services um, in, in the case of providing a more gentle type of, a lot of these things are very aggressively done. You know, when they go and put on these acrylic nails or gel nails, they got 10 nails to put that product on. They're running and filing and doing a lot of things and a lot of times injuries occur as a result of that and sometimes they're not recognized until a day or two later um, that they've actually been injured so mm -hmm. there are a lot there's a lot of training to to take a under your your umbrella of your medical practice a salon and you don't want to just jump into it you you just because we're doctors it doesn't ne necessarily mean we understand that industry as and, well as we and should. And we're not going to be able to train them. We're not going to be able to train them. And exactly. So you have to have a conduit of some standards and, and high standards at that because we're trying to offer a safer environment because, you know, the standard response from a podiatrist when a patient, a female patient asks us, where's a safe place to go get a nail salon service? And the general answer is don't go in there. You're going to get injured. And sure enough, they're still going to pursue that because they want to get those pretty nails. So they need to know where to go and yeah. what questions to ask to, to have a safe service. So um, some of the standard responses have just caused bigger problems in our history as podiatrists because we're not referring them to people who have the advanced training or the advanced services. Yeah, oh, very good. Well, thank you so much, Robert. We covered a lot of information. Appreciate your time. Okay. Sure. Looking forward to it. We'll see each other again, I'm sure.